Good to see you this morning. Trust that you've um, had an uh, excellent week and that uh, you look forward to being with us today and uh, that uh, you came expecting to have the Lord speak to you. And if that is the case, I am quite certain that uh, you uh, will hear him speak to you in this service today as we sing and pray and preach uh, the word of God. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, our announcements uh, as we look at them. First of all, I'll back up and say that yesterday at uh, First Baptist uh, here in Sylvester, we had uh, our Mallory uh, meeting as we were trying to help train uh, folks. Uh, we were especially had our um, intention of uh, helping uh, smaller churches, uh, churches with bivocational pastors, bivocational music uh, directors, uh, bivocational uh, workers in youth ministry and youth workers in general. And we, I thought we had a good meeting. Uh, Charlie uh, came, and um, in, in the music world, they had only two folks show up, Charlie and a lady in the, the youth ministry, music ministry at uh, First Baptist. And so they had some one-on-one. -on -one. The, uh, uh, the uh, director of um, uh, music down at Moultrie was the, the leader of that. But I think they enjoyed uh, what was there. And so... Um, uh, then we had in the uh, youth uh, division part of it uh, was a uh, fellow from Anderson College uh, put that on. And uh, they had a, a good group of folks in the youth. That They were the largest group of folks there and um, was well represented by many of our churches. We didn't have anyone from our church attend, but we did from several of our other churches here in Worth County. And uh, we had a good, good uh, meeting. They said they had good information. And uh, so we um, was very successful. And then from the... Uh, uh, by vocational pastors, I think we had six or seven uh, uh, men from the area, uh, some that are currently by vocational pastors and some uh, hope maybe that that will be a ministry they could be involved in. And so uh, there and uh, we had several speakers and then we had a panel of by vocational uh, pastors uh, speaking uh, or being involved in it. I was one of those on the panel. And so we had a good, good uh, meeting there and I thought it was well, well worth the time. Uh, that we put on for that. And uh, so, um, so we enjoyed that. Of course, uh, we'll have our regular services uh, tonight. Uh, we encourage you to come and be present. We're studying through the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're in probably the, one of the most familiar chapters of uh, 1 Corinthians tonight. We'll start with the 13th chapter, and that's generally called the love chapter and used in weddings a lot uh, for that. And so uh, that's the chapter that we'll be in tonight. Uh, Wednesday night prayer meeting, we encourage you to come at 6.30. Uh, and uh, for this is the last Wednesday night of the month for our adults. We'll be looking at our prayer calendar. And so uh, we'll be uh, praying for the ones on that. Now, what we will do, if uh, we have not heard from you, if you have not told us something about the person, unless we know that that person has a condition uh, that is permanent and we need to leave them on there. But if it's just something that we know nothing about, we're going to take them off the prayer calendar. It's not that we don't want to pray for them or that we won't put them back on. We want to hear. We want to know how to pray for them. We want to know what's going on in their lives. And so we take them off. This is a monthly prayer calendar by and large. And so uh, in taking them off, we're not saying you can't put them back on or we don't want you, but we want to keep up to date and so we can do a good praying for the people that are on it. And if you look at your prayer calendar, it's gotten uh, quite quite large. We've got some, uh, some folks on there that's been on there for some time. And so please let us know if you put a name on there, uh, what's going on uh, on, the, on the prayer calendar uh, for that. Uh, and then uh, just for the things that uh, we've got uh, coming up, I'm going to only mention a few brief things. We're, we're going to work on and, um, and have some discussion uh, about putting both on Facebook and uh, other places, uh, updating on what's going on, both the more recent stuff and the stuff that's going to be out in the future uh, uh, so that you can be able to click on them on your phone or on your computer so that you can get those things. So we don't have a handout bulletin and we're not planning on going back to a handout bulletin, but we want to make us accessible to you so you can get up-to-date material on what we're doing. So we're going to do that and then we'll let you know how we're doing that so you can click on it and be able to get it at any time, any place uh, that you want to. Uh, and, and one of the things we're going to try to start narrowing down is how much time I stand up here talking to you about what we're going to be doing so that 
you know, you will be able to click on it and get it easily. One of the things we do want you to know about is our Easter uh, program that we're going to be putting on. It's going to be on the uh, Friday and Saturday right before Easter. It's going to be a program that, weather permitting, it's going to be outside. It's going to be a walkthrough, but you're not going to have to be worrying about walking through it because you're going to be involved in it. You're going to be a participant in it. And uh, you, you're not going to have speaking parts. You're not going to be doing that. You'll just be an actor in it, doing a scene. We're having that all that's being prepared. And in a couple of weeks, preparation is what it's going to take for you. All you need to do is be available for that. There'll be a narrator. Things will be going on. And so you'll know about that. You just be available and be ready to do that when we ask you to do it. And so uh, we want to use that as an outreach tool uh, to folks that may not be comfortable necessarily coming into church, but they'd love to do something like this. And you'll be inviting friends and we'll be advertising for that. Is that good enough for our Easter thing? And then our VBS is uh, coming up. We need to let folks know. We have sign-up sheet outside for that. Is it on? Not yet. There will be a sign-up sheet uh, outside for the uh, VBS teachers and workers coming up very soon. It's going to be on the bulletin board uh, out there. And uh, you see the information there uh, on our screens. And so it, it will be uh, June 12th before we can turn around. We need volunteers and workers. Uh, we are anticipating a large group of children uh, for that. And so VBS uh, planning is in full swing, and we need it uh, to, uh, to be ready for that. And then we've got more stuff. We've got July uh, stuff coming. We've got August stuff coming. We've got September stuff coming. We've got October stuff coming. All that's coming up in the future. I'm not going to uh, jump on all of that uh, right now. Uh, this afternoon, if you would like to do so, uh, Mr. Little was the man that originally helped us draw some of the architectural design uh, for our facility here. He's uh, helping a church up in um, Crisp County, and then he's going to come by and take some pictures of the, what's been done here. And uh, if you would like to talk with him or see him, please do him no harm. Um, uh, but if you'd just like to see him, uh, if you would let Doyle know, Doyle's going to meet him down here. Give Doyle your cell phone number and he'll text you and you can come uh, see him and, and meet him. Uh, uh, that's Mr. Little. And so uh, just uh, after service today, probably be the easiest, just write your cell phone number down on a piece of paper and hand it and your name and hand it to Doyle and he'll make sure that you are aware of when he's coming because we don't know exactly when he'll finish up at uh, Ebenezer Church there in Crisp County and Doyle will be more than happy for you to come and join with them as he, uh, as he comes. Uh, down here. Any other announcement now that I need to take care of that I didn't? Uh, we'll continue to remember those folks we've had on our prayer list. We have Praise Island. Scott's doing well. Uh, he's moved to the house. They've rented up there. Talked with him Friday. Uh, he was uh, doing well. He'd had his puppy brought to him, and so him and the puppy are in, enjoying some time uh, together. Uh, he was um, picking uh, pretty good at candy, and so they're, they're, they are doing well. Uh, continue to pray for Katie and Corin. Uh, that uh, things will go well and as we've uh, hopefully um, uh, God will provide in both those cases as we've been praying for that. I've been asked also to put Ida Ida, Ida Peters uh, on our prayer list. That's Annette Watson's aunt. She fell and uh, broke her right wrist. Is that right? Where's Donna? Right wrist uh, and left knee and they're going to do surgery today. She's 91 years old in her 90s. Uh, that's uh, uh, Buddy Watson's uh, wife is Annette and that's her aunt and so um, they ask if we would put her on the prayer list and pray for her and we'll certainly be happy uh, to do that uh, for it. All right we are glad to see you. I uh, trust if you're a visitor here you'll enjoy our services today. If you're listening to us new or you listen to us uh, through the means of our uh, video systems uh, we encourage you to enjoy our services with us today. Brother Charlie is going to lead us in singing. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And that's our first hymn this morning. Let's stand up and sing from the bottom of my heart to our holy God, our God Almighty. Let's all stand. Number three.
Let's take our Bibles and turn uh, to uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. I encourage you, though we put the scripture on the screen in front of you, to uh, bring your Bible and open it up and read with us. Certainly this morning when we get to sermon time, that will be an advantage to you. 2 Peter chapter 1 says, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God of God and of, of Jesus our Lord, and his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which we have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust." But also for this very reason, giving all due diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will, neither, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who likes these things is short-sighted even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which we do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brother Roy, would you lead us in prayer? <clears throat> Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you, Lord, for this beautiful day that you've created. Thank you, Lord, for letting us be able to be up and about and be able to come to church, hear your word read, hear your word preached, sing the songs of Zion. We pray, Lord, you just bless our church family. Help each one of us, Lord, be grateful and thankful. We know that we all have valleys and mountains, and Lord, just help us to climb the mountains and go through the valleys. We know that with your help and your presence, Lord, it makes it so much easier. So we pray, Lord, that we'd all look to you and pray and seek your will, Father. <coughs> we ask you to bless our church family, Lord, those that's been mentioned we ask you to bless the Griffiths family as a loss of Brother Tony's brother. Bless that family, Lord. Comfort them. Strengthen them. We pray for the Carter family, Lord, as they lost a member of their family this week in a very tragic situation. And we pray for that family, Lord, that you may fill in the absence. And Lord, help them look to you and lean on you and Lord, your presence just may be with them and lead and guide them. Lord, we pray for Kaylee and the Giddens family. Lord, she's been sick for a while, and Lord, this has been going on for a while, and we pray, Lord, that you would make a heart, 
and kidneys, Lord, I understand she may have to have a kidney transplant. Lord, make it available as quickly as possible, and we pray that you will, we know that you don't make mistakes, and we pray that you will send the right heart, Lord, that they might can put in her body, and Lord, that she might be able to recover and come out of down there and come back home and Lord get well we know Lord they've been through a terrible terrible lot and a serious crisis and we just pray we pray for Scott Lord we thank you for the report that we've heard on him and seem like he's doing much better and Lord we thank you for that and we pray that you'll continue to bless him and his family Lord we know that uh, modern medicine has gone a long way, Lord, and they just take your heart and out and put you a new one in, and take your liver and put you a new one in, and Lord, we don't understand all that, but we know you do, and we thank you, Lord, for giving men the knowledge and wisdom in the medical field to be able to do that, and the person still be able to live. We thank you for that, Lord. We've come a long way. But Lord, we ask you to bless our churches, help us. Lord, medically, help us physically. But Lord, we ask to help us spiritually. Our church needs our presence. We all need, Lord, you in our lives. We pray that you bless Antioch Baptist Church in the days to come. Help us, Lord, to serve you. And help us, Lord, to hold services that will be pleasing to you. And Lord, we ask you to bless our country, this United States of America. Looks like, Lord, we might be on the brink of another war. We don't know politics. They play in politics or whatever, but, Lord, we just pray for our country and our men and women in the armed services, Lord, that maybe we won't have no war. Because we know when you have war, Lord, lives are lost and lives are taken. So we pray for that situation, Father. And most of all, Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. We thank you, Lord, for being with us when all else fails, Lord, you still there. Ask you to bless now this day. Bless our pastor. Help him, Lord, to bring the message that you would have him to bring. Bless Charlie as he leads to singing. Bless these things that's said and done here in this church. And these things we pray. Amen. morning. How's it going, everybody? All right, we all know what we've been talking about the last several Sundays. We've been talking about how to glorify God's name, how to glorify God. And we talked about what it means to glorify God. One way is, is to, to speak highly of Him, to tell other people how great He is, how wonderful He is, right? Yep, and we've been talking about things in our own lives, things that, that we play with or... Uh, hobbies, things that in our lives that we can use to glorify God and how we can use those things. And we've talked about all kinds of toys and today is Ryder's turn. Ryder has brought something for us to talk about and my man brought a football. Oh yeah. Well, this is a Nerf football. This is a Nerf football. You can throw it and bump somebody in the head and it won't hurt too bad. I got one. You got one? I got one. Yeah. You like to play football? You play. You like to get uh, teams up at school and play football? Yeah, how many of you like to play sports? I do too. I really like football. It's my favorite sport, baseball. I think. Baseball, yeah, baseball is a favorite sport. I do gymnastics. You do gymnastics? And dance. That's cool. And cheerleading. You do a lot of sports. <laughs> soccer. Jordan plays soccer, and it's something that we've been learning here lately. But it's a, it's a cool sport. It's a lot of fun. Uh, she uh, run in cross country, gymnastics, a lot of you dance, cheerleading, football, baseball. There's all kinds of sports, but they all got one thing in common, right? What are you working to do when you play sports? To win. To win. That's right. I mean, we do want to learn good sportsmanship. 
and we do want to learn our, our craft or our sport and be the best we can at it. But we all want to win when we compete, right? We compete to win. And of course, when we win, we get a trophy or we get some sort of reward. Ain't that right? Yep. Jordan's got some trophies. Maybe you've been on a team before that has won a trophy. Any of you have any trophies or rewards sitting around the house? Sometimes we play for the reward of bragging rights. You guys know what that is? That means you put a football team in the backyard together, and if you win that football team, you get to brag about it for the whole week until you play the next game. You just get to say, I won, right? Yep, that's what we work for. It got me to thinking about this. Do you guys know that we have been promised rewards in heaven? Did you know that? We've been promised rewards for even the smallest thing. And what we ought to be doing in our Christian walk is working for those rewards. We ought to be playing hard, learning our craft, which is reading the Bible, learning all about Jesus, learning how to behave, how to act, how to tell other people about Jesus, right? And we ought to be working very hard at it to win a with a with a, let's see if I can say the word right. To win a reward is very difficult. You're not just given a reward. Anybody watch Super Bowl? The Rams won it. And I promise you it was a difficult year. They worked very hard. There's a lot of practice that goes into winning the Super Bowl. There's a lot of great teams that you have to play against. Of course, the Georgia Bulldogs won a national championship. It was a tough year. They worked very hard. I read somewhere that some of those guys were showing up at practice at like 4.30 in the morning. That's, that's a tough year. You have to work. That's, that's what I said. Oh, man. You have to work hard. The Braves, they won uh, the World Series. Can you imagine how hard they had to work? There are some great baseball teams, and they had to play against every one of them. Sometimes they had some, some big-time losses, but they pulled through, and at the end of the year, they pulled it out, and they won. It was a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to earn a reward. And sometimes we kind of look at our Christian walk as just us just being Christian, right? There's a lot of work involved. We have a lot of work to do, all right? But this is what Jesus promises. Let me read this to you. It comes out of Matthew chapter 10, and it's verse 41 and 42. It's, it's two verses, and I want you to stay with me. Everybody ready? Here we go. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall re receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water, only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall by no means lose his reward. You know what that means? Break it down in South Georgia terms. That means that God don't forget anything. Nothing. We'll get a reward for the smallest act of kindness in Jesus' name. He doesn't forget anything. Next time you play football, think about the fact that every time that you do something for Christ and you earn a reward, it will not be forgotten. That is a great reason to glorify God's name. The God that forgets nothing. The cooler part is this. He says he won't forget a single time that he rewards you. But when you accept Jesus as your Savior, he throws your sins as far as the east is from the west and completely forgets those. What an awesome God. He did. Yeah, that's one of my favorite parts of it too. So remember this. You play in your sports, you're out to win. In our Christian life, be out to earn your rewards. Do good for, for God. Work hard for Jesus, all right? And glorify God to the point that he's not going to forget any of it. He'll remember every little act, okay? All right. Thanks, Ryder. That's cool. Who wants to go next? Any takers? Anybody? You want to go? Okay, you're up. We'll get you next Sunday. Deal? Okay. All right. Y'all bow your heads and say a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this day. God, thank you for sports, Lord. We love them. We have a great time uh, watching the competition on television. We have a, a great time competing in our backyards and in recreation and school sports, Lord. It's just a lot of fun. And, Lord, we, we go out there and we work hard. 
we practice long, long days, Lord. And we work hard to try to win. And we, we win because we want the reward, Lord. We want the reward of a trophy or, or just the, the, the reward of feeling good about winning the game. God, help us to live our Christian lives the same way, Lord. Help us to work hard for the rewards that you've promised. God, thank you for being such an awesome God that you promise you won't forget even the smallest act of kindness, not even the smallest job that we do in your name, God. You promise that you're going to reward us for it and it'll never be forgotten. God, thank you that if we accept Jesus, that not only will you reward us for our, our kind acts one day, but you'll forget all of our sin. In Jesus' name we pray. As we stand and sing off to our hymn this morning, let's remember, and it's since Jesus came into my heart, try to remember the day that you let Jesus come in your heart, how much it changed your life. And that's a decision you've made that's more important than who you marry, what you do for a living, where you go to school, uh, who you pull for the football team. To put Jesus in your heart is more the most important decision you'll ever make in your ever life because it has to do with eternity. So as you're thinking, singing, since Jesus came in your heart, just think about that moment in time. Let's all stand. 503. it up, Lord. I ask that you would just be with the ones in the congregation that might be going through difficult times, Lord, just to help them, Lord. Lord, I ask that you would just be with the many ones on the prayer list, Lord. We thank you so much for what you did with Scott. Just ask that he just might get better and be able to come home, Lord. Just want to lift Katie and Corn up, just be with their families, Lord. Now, Lord, I ask that you would just be with Brother Bruce. He brings a message, Lord. Just give him the words that we need to hear, Lord. Now, Lord, I ask that you would just be with the offering, Lord. Just let the church do with it what your will might be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, if I'm about to sing, that means we're at the bottom of the list. Okay? <laughs> now, next week, we're going to be back at the top of the list. Okay? I promise you. And uh, y'all believe it or not, I'm nervous as a cat. In fact, I'm drinking a bottle of water. I don't know if it was Bruce's or whatever, but we're willing in Christ. <laughs> and we share, right? I know how y'all feel. I thought, why do people get up here and drink water and sing? Uh, I thought, because I'm dry as I'll get out right now. But anyway, uh, look, <laughs> y'all just bear with us on this deal. Uh, March the 6th, mark it down. The choir will be back. <laughs> Applaud, people. All right. All right. We got through with this book of the Pukas, COVID mess, and we're going to be back. Uh, uh, Claire's going to be, she's going to be gone next week, but soon after that, we will be back. So anyway, and look, if you'd like to join the choir, now is time to join. And if you think, oh, I can't sing. Look, if I can see Clint Eastwood sing on Rawhide, you can sing. And some of y'all are saying, who is Clint Eastwood and who is Rawhide? It's something in 58, okay? That's long before most of you thought about. So anyway, please come up here and join the choir if you feel like you need to. Now, the song I'd like to sing was copyrighted back in 1944 by a strong-willed Jones woman named Ruth Jones. I don't know Ruth Jones from anybody, but I'm sure she was one of them Jones women, right? And, uh, but she copyrighted this, and uh, it, what was going on in, in 1944? Some of y'all were living there. You weren't living in 44? Yeah, okay, all right. World War II. And this is the title of the song, In Times Like These. Uh, you know, it, it says, in times like these, we need a, you need a Savior. Imagine World War II. Now, look. I think the world are military nowadays. But this country's so split. We can't even decide mass, no mass, malarkey or no malarkey. Can you imagine us going to war? And we're probably fixing going to war. I don't know. But in that time, it was times like these. We need a savior. Uh, and we need to, in times like these, we need an anchor. And that anchor is Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to tie it out. We need to throw our anchor out there and not hit it on sand that's going to pull. We need to have that anchor on Jesus. And, and, and just the second verse, it says, in times like this, we need the Bible. And Bruce has preached on that and preached on that and preached on that the last two or three Sundays. And I'm talking to myself one day. We need to read the Bible. Now, I'm a slow reader. I can read through words real fast, but me comprehend. Sometimes it takes me two or three times to read. So it takes me a while to read that. But in times like these, like today, we need the Bible. And, and the, it says, oh, be not idle. There's nothing worse than being idle. Idle hands of the devil's workshop. And I know when I get idle, I start meddling and I get in trouble. And, and I shouldn't. Keep busy. If you're 80 years old, keep doing God's work. Moses started when he was 80. There ain't no retirement age, okay? But don't be idle. The worst thing you can ever do to a diesel engine is let it idle. Because the old ones, 15 years ago, they'd start slobbering. And old slobber would come out the turbocharger. Nowadays, they'll stop up the DPF and, and all that mess they do so the woodpeckers will live and you don't smell diesel smoke. But the worst thing you do for a diesel engine is ever let it idle for a long period of time. And the worst person you think you can do to a Christian is let it be idle for a long time. Because then all of a sudden they fall away from church, you don't see them. They start going to where you're there, and they just start doing bad things. So do not be idle. Uh, but we need to, the last verse that says, uh, uh, in times like these, I have a Savior. And then it says, I'm very sure I have a Savior. If you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior today, you need to make very sure before you leave this building. Because just think of the word eternity. And uh, the scripture I'd like to read before that, it comes out of Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the, for the soul, firm and secure. That's Hebrews 6. Now, th there's, there's a little history behind this, and I just throw this first part about this. This was my daddy's song. I grew up in a musical family. Mom sang soprano. Real good. Judy sang auto, and... Uh, my daddy sang bass, and I had no choice but to sing tenor. You know, Mama said, you're singing tenor. I didn't want to sing it. I want to sing bass, but I sang tenor. But this was, if Daddy ever sang a song, it was this one. We called it his anchor song. And Mama sang his island spare. That's probably why I'm getting emotional.
Oh, I'm not going to do it well right now. I should have gone down that path. I got to sing. But anyway, Mama's not doing real well right now. I don't know how much longer she's going to live. I don't know. Y'all just pray for her and pray for Daddy. But anyway, I shouldn't have brought that up because now I ain't going to be able to sing, but I'm going to do the best the Lord will get me through it. So anyway, I like to sing in times like these. Baptist Church is in all activities to glorify God as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to call saints to worship and sinners to repentance. <clears throat> Thank you, Charlie. I couldn't think of a better person to lead our scene. I appreciate Charlie. Uh, one of the things I uh, encouraged Charlie to do yesterday is to um, find out what my sermons are and prepare music that goes along with my sermons. Of course, he, he told them one of the problems was sometimes I didn't know what my sermons were going to be. So uh, um, the good thing about Brother Charlie is he doesn't have to worry about it. Usually he just, the songs he prepares goes along with my sermons. So we're usually in sync pretty good anyhow, so it doesn't matter. All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Revelation. He said he uh, can read fast, but it takes him time. By the time we finish with Revelation chapter 1, y'all may have it memorized. Because we're going to read it several times. Because I won't be out of Revelation chapter 1 for several weeks. We're, we're going to be here uh, a good little bit. So you're going to hear Revelation chapter 1. Pretty good little bit. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 1. 
If you found it, those that can stand, please do, and I'll read this for us. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the rulers over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His heads and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, and as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place. That's the verse we'll look at this morning. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars... And are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands, which you saw are the seven churches. Thank you. you. May be seated. We uh, talked last week uh, that the uh, opening of the book we saw is entitled The Revelation of Jesus Christ. And uh, we simply spoke on the word revelation. It comes uh, from the Greek word apostle. Apocalypso, and it simply means uh, to reveal, to unveil, to take the cover off. And so here the last book of the Bible is the unveiling or taking the cover off or revealing who Jesus Christ is. It is the completion of all that has gone before. And so really to get a good idea of what uh, the, uh, the revelation is about, you have to know something about who this person Jesus Christ is, and you have to have a good idea of why he needs to be unveiled. And so we went back and just took a quick step through the entire Bible and, and broke it down. And I'm just right quick like now if it's going to give that outline. I'm not going to discuss the outline uh, and I'm going to go quickly through it. And I'm not going to give you enough time to write this outline. I just don't have that time this morning. Those that were here, you may get to complete something that you missed. If you don't get this outline, you can do one of a couple of things. You can go back and if you weren't here last Sunday, you will probably, if you want to stay up to date, go back to last week's message. It'll be on YouTube or our Facebook page and listen at it. Or uh, you can, I have them written down. You can get them from me if you think you can read my handwriting. You can, you can get them uh, from me. And so uh, uh, you can do that, and then we're going to pick up from there. But I think this is something I want to, to just, as we step into the message this morning. So, of course, the Bible starts with the book of Genesis, and the first 11 chapters, Genesis 1 through 11, uh, and I've just given these titles, and you could go back through there and give them other titles. These are just my titles. I've given Genesis chapter 1 through 11 as hope lost. 
I've given then Genesis chapter 12 through the end of the chapter, through the end of the book, that's chapter 50, hope promised. Then I've given Exodus chapter 1 through the book of Ruth, Call the word wanderings, W-A-N-D-E-R-I-N-G-S, wandering, to move around. Then I've given a section uh, that's uh, Sam, Samuel. Now, there's first and second Samuel, but I, I just introduced it as Samuel through second Chronicles. And along with that, Isaiah through Daniel as the temple era. That's uh, one, two, three, that's the fourth one. The fifth time period is the books of Ezra through Esther, and along with that, the books of Hosea through Malachi as the period of darkness, darkness. And if you go back and study, you'll find those are in time-related periods. Those are the times those books were written together. So that gets us through the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, we have Matthew through John. That's the Gospels, and I've, I've named that the period of light, light. The next period, which will be the seventh period, is the book of Acts through Jude. Acts through Jude. That is the church period. And that is actually a period that is hidden. It is a parenthesis period and is unlike any other period. And then the final period, which we really did not discuss last week, and is our discussion this morning, is the Revelation. And I've called it the discovery period period. It is when he is unveiled. And so I've called it the discovery period. And I know I didn't tell you it was the discovery period last week. And the reason I know that is because I was told that after service. I didn't give that one. So here it is. It is the discovery period. And so, um, so what I want to do this morning before we uh, launch into the uh, verse by verse and chapter by chapter study of the book of Revelation, I want to do for Revelation what I've done for the whole Bible. I want to give you the 10,000 foot view of the Revelation. See, see, it's sometimes you can get lost in the details and I don't want you to get lost in the details. I want to give you an overview of this book. And I want you to see the details from a higher point of view. Uh, many uh, years ago, I took a course on speed reading, how to uh, quickly read through material uh, to gain the information that I needed. And one of the things you learn in speed reading, before you try to read something quickly, you need to stop and spend a little time understanding what you're going to read. Your brain needs to understand the path that you're going on. And the first thing you need to do if you're going to be a speed reader is read the table of contents. And now I know folks that want to read fast think, wait a minute, I just want to read, but it doesn't work that way. So you have to stop and read the table of contents, get a grasp of where you're going. For, for your mind, if you don't do that, when you start in a, uh, a chapter, it, it is going to want to stop and get the details as you go along because it says, wait, I got I to have a road map. I got to know where I'm going and I'm not going to go with you down this road if I don't know where I'm going. And so if you have given it a road map, it will more easily follow you down a road. And then in speed reading, the next thing uh, you need to do is start with a chapter you're going to read and just read the first line of the uh, paragraphs you're going to read so that your brain has figured out where you're going. Once you do that, to speed read a chapter is easy. All you've got to do is let your roadmap that's already programmed in your mind, start following the key words <clears throat> down through a passage. And I can read, if I choose to do that, a large passage of scripture or a large uh, chapter in a book in a very quick period of time. Of course, I found out pretty quick that didn't do me any good. Because if I'm reading uh, the, the theological material that I read uh, to try to prepare stuff, I run across words in it that I don't know what they mean. And some I can't pronounce. And so it does me no good to read them fast because, yeah, I know the words. I just don't know what they mean. And so uh, I have to stop and go look them up and, uh, and do those kind of things. So it takes time to read anyhow. So it doesn't do me any good to speed read them. I've got to go back and figure them out. And I love to read for pleasure. The folks that know me know I love to read for pleasure. 
And I am an eclectic reader. I read all kinds of materials. I read some wild, fantastic books. Uh, I, 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 love, I love science fiction. I love historical fiction. Uh, I, I love all kinds of genres of, 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 of reading. And I don't want to speed read that. I want to enjoy it. I like to read and savor what I read. You know, sort of just enjoy and slow down. I love to go where I'm reading. I love to become part of that. I, y'all don't want to hear that. And so, um, and so speed reading didn't do me any good. But, so why are you telling us this, preacher? Well, I wanted to. No, when you start to read something like the Revelation, if I can give you the road map, if we can get the big picture, then hopefully, hopefully you can follow where we're going when we dive down into some of the more difficult details. The Bible just promised us if we would just read this book, he would bless us for that. And then if we would open our spirit, if we would open our mind up and allow the spirit to teach us this book, we would be blessed indeed. When he comes to the end of the book, over in the last chapter, he tells us that it is indeed one of the most joyous things we'll ever have is to understand this book that we're reading. It is not a sealed book. He tells John to leave the book open so it can be read and understood. But today, the devil has sowed into this world, into the minds of the people of this world. And I hear preachers, I heard one yesterday telling us that you ought to be careful reading the revelation, uh, that you ought to spend your time on other things when the revelation itself says, read it and get a blessing. And so I think if I can just give you this morning uh, a, a simple overview, and here is the key to the book right here. Here is the table of contents. It is in the, the uh, 19th verse. I told you it's the verse that says, Write the things which you have seen. That's chapter 1. Table of contents. And that is literally this first chapter that I'm reading to you. That is the things that John had seen. He's telling about those things right here in this chapter that he'd seen. He, he had seen his risen Lord. He had seen him in what we will just talk about uh, in the weeks to come. And uh, he, out of that, he's going to gather a lot of information and pass it down to us so that we will understand what's going to be happening in the book just because of the scene that's displayed before him. Then he's going to tell him, after you understand these things, he says, then write the things which are. Chapters 2 and chapters 3 are the things which are. We're still living in that period. The things which are. Those things which are, uh, the, the things that are happening, we are living in that age now. And he, uh, he uh, uh, writes out, lists seven churches uh, that are. And uh, we're going to talk about these seven churches. And you're going to find out that I've changed uh, a little bit on how I view these seven churches. Uh, historically, we have taught, and I have taught, and many have taught, that these are a picture of seven uh, ages inside of the church age, with, beginning with Ephesus and running through Laodicea, and uh, each one represents a particular age. And I'm not sure I uh, uh, tremendously agree with that anymore. And we'll look at that as we look through it. So we'll, we'll talk about, so, so those two chapters, chapter 2 and chapter 3, List the things that are. And then, beginning with chapter 4, he says for us, after these things I look. So he will talk about the things that are thereafter. So that will be chapter 3. I know that's chapter 4, but that'll be in our table of contents. I'm in my table of contents. There are three listings. The first chapter, the second chapter, and the third chapter. That's all that's in the table of contents. And the, the first chapter is the things that he had seen. The second chapter is the things that are. And the third chapter are the things that will happen thereafter. And they begin at, in the Revelation in chapter 4. Remember, when this book was written, there were no chapters and verses in it. We put them in about 1300, 1400 BC, uh, uh, AD after Christ. 
They came along, got put in. And so these are the things that would be after. And when we pick up in what we've got in chapter 4 here, you will find that there is not a mention of the church again to the 21st chapter. You won't see anything talking about the church. It, don't talk, it doesn't talk about the bride. It doesn't talk about anything that remotely mentions the church of Jesus Christ. And so uh, here, uh, the church is no longer in view. And so we will, we will see uh, those things that will take place after the church. After this church is no longer here uh, on the planet. And you know by now, <clears throat> there are several views about what will happen to the church. And we have talked about them, and we will talk about them some more. Uh, it, it is not important to you going to heaven what view you have on what happens to the church. That is not a point of argument as far as I'm concerned. I have a view, and I believe that view is right. But listen, the most important view is that you believe that Jesus Christ came and died for your sins and rose again, and that you are a sinner and you must accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, and that's the view that counts. He'll work the rest out. What, no matter what I believe about his second coming, uh, whether I've got it right or not, or you've got it right or not, or they've got it right or not, I want to tell you, that doesn't matter. Uh, we, we spend too much of our time arguing about his second coming. I want to tell you, we better get his first coming right first. He'll worry about the second coming on his own. And so here we're talking then about his second coming. So we see then uh, heaven has been opened up and we see uh, the things that take place in heaven as he begins uh, to uh, prepare this world for his second coming. And uh, in that John looks and uh, the Lord stands up and he's handed a book uh, that is sealed with seven seals. Uh, those are the redemption seals of the earth. Uh, the devil has had a death grip on this earth since uh, Adam in the garden uh, relinquished the right of the earth to the devil. And uh, from that period of time until now, the Bible says the devil has been the prince of the power of the air. He has had a death grip and has been running rapture over this world. He has been giving havoc to the world. He has been uh, giving uh, this world uh, a good old-fashioned whipping. Uh, he has been uh, having his way <clears throat> with men and has been dragging multiplied thousands, millions into the region of hell with him. And so here, finally, as the picture of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus stands up in his redeemed person and receives the title deed to this world. Because indeed, whether the devil knows it or not, or likes it or not, this is Jesus' world. He made it. He created it. He spoke it into existence. And he paid for it with his blood on Calvary's hill. This is Jesus' world. And he will take it back. He has allowed Satan to have his way for these last years, but his time is swiftly coming to an end. And when he stands up and takes the scroll, the Bible says uh, he begins to unseal, to lift the seals, the seven seals. The sixth chapter is the beginning of the lifting of those seals, and we will see then, as he does so, the first seal lifts and a rider comes out riding on a white horse in peace, and he has a bow in his hand, but there's no arrow in the bow. And so we see this is the beginning of what will take place on planet Earth as the one we know as the Antichrist uh, begins his uh, rule uh, here on planet Earth. Uh, he will appear to come as a peacemaker. He will appear to come as one that has an answer to the world's problems. But as you, uh, we begin to look and the seals will begin to be peeled back, we will find that this uh, seeming peacemaker will soon turn into a death maker. And we will see that as the different horses uh, ride out uh, onto planet Earth. And um, God begins to redeem uh, this world out of his hands as the different seals begin uh, to uh, be taken away uh, from, uh, from planet earth. Now, it is, it is uh, if we are, again, I'll, I told you, and I want you to understand, 
I believe we're nearing the end of the age. I believe that the teaching of the church ought to be the imminent return of Christ. I believe we ought to teach that Jesus Christ could come back. I believe that teaching ought to have been the teaching of the church throughout the ages. I believe we ought to have been able to teach that 1,500 years ago and be correct, 1,000 years ago and be correct, 500 years ago and be correct, 250 years ago and be correct. We ought to teach that today and be correct. If Jesus does not come back today, uh, we ought to be able to teach it 50 years from now and be correct. If Jesus does not come back by then, 500 years from now, we can teach that and be correct. 1,000 years if Jesus does not come back, we can teach that and be correct because Jesus is imminently coming. He can come back at this moment if he chooses to do so. If he does not choose to do so, it may be that we do not know, and we certainly don't know everything. Uh, he may have something else to reveal, and he may come back a thousand years from now. But we better be prepared for him to come back today. That is what we teach and believe. And I believe that we look at the scenes around about us and it appears like to me, from what I know of the Bible, that we have a world system falling in line with what I see in the Bible. We see a world preparing for this being that rides out, and we see him in the 6th, 7th, and 8th chapters of the uh, book of Revelation here. It appears like that we have what is in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th chapters of Daniel, of the 4th the, the beast, the 4th image of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, of the, the coming true. Those things appear to me. I want to tell you, when you see global governments doing what global governments are doing today, it is chilling it is chilling to see in the United States of America governments mandating to free people what we have to do to survive in our own country. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to get into the argument with folks about mask or no mask, vax or no vax. That is a personal decision for you. You have to make that decision. I don't have a right to tell you what you should or shouldn't do. But I do not believe government should or has the right to mandate you to tell you how you ought to make your personal health or your personal decisions. It is a heavy-handed government that will soon take your rights away from you that can tell you what you must personally do. If you don't believe that, just lift your eyes a little past the United States and go to our neighbor to the north. And look what's been happening in Canada over the last several weeks. And there you have a government that has moved down the road of a socialist government just a little farther than the United States has moved. And their, their government is exercising dictatorial authority over a part of their society that just, won't, just stood up and said, I've had enough, I don't want to do this. And so the heavy hand of government has come down and is taking those folks' lives away from them, even to the point of taking their animals away from them. I want to tell you, folks, you better open your eyes we're living on the verge of a world dictatorial system, whether it's the end of time or not. Look out at the world. You have two oppressive communist systems on the rise. You have Russia threatening to take over the Ukraine. You have uh, Russia uh, uh, arming itself and getting ready uh, to make war in uh, Eastern Europe. And then you have China, which I believe is a much greater threat than Russia, flexing its muscles uh, in uh, Asia and uh, preparing and doing uh, much more than, than Russia is doing really, preparing uh, to, uh, to rule and to take over the part of the world in which it lives in. And I want to tell you, Russia dictates more to America than you want to believe. When Russia sneezes, America catches a cold. When China sneezes, we catch the flu. Literally. 
And some of y'all may get that one day. Uh, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm saying wake up. We are preparing, I believe, for this day that when the seals are unsealed, this man of sin will stand up and say, wait a minute, I've got an answer for some of these problems. I can, add, I can deal with, with, with this. We'll deal with, I, I, we'll deal with all that as we come along. So we'll see the, we'll see the uh, seven seals as Jesus begins to snatch back this world from Satan. But I want to tell you, Satan is a foe. He is, he is, he is no foe to God, but he definitely uh, will not go easily. And so then we will have the uh, trumpet, the seven trumpet uh, seals begin to uh, be opened. And, uh, and uh, as he is uh, rested away, the power that he has here on this earth. And then uh, in the 10th chapter, there'll be a pause. And the writer will see as God explains to him the situation that's going on on this planet. Uh, mass chaos and death and mayhem and murder. And so the spirit stops and says, John, here, I want you to understand what all is happening. So he will explain what is happening to the church. He will explain what is happening to Israel. He'll talk about the witnesses, the, the witnesses uh, that are there, the two witnesses. He'll talk about uh, the 144,000 that are being sealed. Now, all of those things will take place. He will, he will talk about them in the third, all the way up to the 13th, 14th chapter uh, of that. All of that we will discuss and we will look at. So he, he will bring those things into focus. And then starting with the 15th chapter, he will resume the judgment of this world. He will resume the taking away of the power of Satan from this world, and it will come under the form of what is called bold judgments or vile judgments. It will be the final judgment. So what you will see is three sets of judgments. The seals that are on the title deed, that's come first. And then the trumpet judgments, and then the vile or bold judgments. So that'll be a set of seven judgments, each, each passed out in these three areas. Numbers mean something in the Bible. You don't need to just pass over them. There are some sets of numbers that mean something. Tens mean something. In the first chapter that I read to you, 10 is mentioned, uh, seven, I'm sorry, sevens are mentioned 10 times. Sevens mean something. They're mentioned 10 times in the first chapter. 53 times in the book of Revelation, the number seven is mentioned. Twelves mean something. They are mentioned 20 plus times in the Revelation, the number 12. Sevens mean completion. When, when God mentions sevens, I mean, he's finishing something up. So here we've seen these seven uh, judgments. He's finishing them up. And threes mean something. And you're going to see threes all throughout this. We'll talk about them as we go. I mentioned that because you're seeing these numbers just run through them. Don't, don't just pass them up. See them as we, as we move through these things. And so uh, chapter 15, we will, we will start the final judgments. We will, we will hear the death knell of the Antichrist. We will see finally what began over in the ninth chapter of Genesis dealt with. And that is this mysterious religion of Babylon. And really what it is, is that heart of men, mankind, that wants to worship anything else other than God. It is in the heart of men that will choose to worship anything other than God. Man's heart, your heart, will rebel and choose to worship anything other than God if given the chance. You know how I've seen that, how I know that? Well, one thing, I remember when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, he'd been up there just a little while, and before he could come back down, guess what? The Israelites that had been rescued from the land of Egypt had been taken care of by God, that was being looked after by God, and Moses had only been up there a short period of time. Guess what they'd already done? They built themselves a golden calf to worship. An idol made with their own hands, they had already started worshiping. And I want to warn you, brother, 
I want to warn you, sister, if you're not careful, you'll start worshiping something other than the God of heaven, something you've made. You'll worship your job. <clears throat> you'll worship your children. You'll, you'll worship something other. Uh, we'll worship our grandchildren. Anything you put ahead of God is an idol. <clears throat> Some folks worship their bank accounts. Oh, wait a minute, preacher. You just started preaching on money again. Yep. Because in America, that's what people worship. <clears throat> Finally, we'll see the fall of the Antichrist in 19 and 20. We'll see him bound, released, and then finally forever judged and done away with. We'll see every wicked person. Folks say, where is justice? Why, when will right ever be right? I see evil people, and they seem to get away with everything. And, and people that try to do right, they don't seem to be able to get by. <clears throat> wait, wait. You had not seen the end of the story yet. Chapter 20 says, there's coming a day of restitution. There's coming a day of judgment. And God is going to open up the books. And for the evil world, he's going to judge this evil world. And for every evil person, they're going to account for every evil deed. Every evil act. Every time they've oppressed a godly person. Every time they've done wrong. Every time. They're going to answer for every evil deed. Now think about it. If you're a believer, if you've been redeemed, your evil acts have been covered up. Oh man, I, if that was me, I'd shout hallelujah. Because you've got some. But because you've got a loving God that has paid your price and covered your sins up, your sins have been covered in the blood of Jesus. He answered for them on the cross. But for that person that is lost, he'll have to answer for every one of his sins himself. And then he's got to pay for them. You know how he's got to pay for them? I don't wish this on anybody. He's got to spend eternity in hell. Forever and ever and ever and ever and ever without end. Somebody says, but preacher, won't there one day come an end? No. Never. Never, 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 never. Never. If you step off into the abyss of hell, you never come back. You never die. It never ends. The price has been paid for a free redemption forever in heaven. And if you choose not to accept it, you choose to spend eternity in hell forever and ever in torment everlasting. That's your choice, not his. He said he chose not any should perish, but that all should come to everlasting life. You choose hell, not him. Hell is your choice. Jesus will never tell you to go to hell. You choose that freely. And you'll admit it because you'll stand there before him and you'll admit every sinful thought, every sinful act, you will come right out of your mouth. You will be the one to condemn you. And then you will step off. You won't be shoved into hell. I've heard preachers talk, well, you're going to get shoved. No, you won't. You're not going to be shoved into hell. You will step off into hell forever. And then finally, chapters 21 and 22. So that the redeemed will have a brand new creation made for us. We're in no sin at all will be seen. The Bible will create a new world where all the effects of sin will be wiped away. Not one scar of sin on planet earth. Not one visible effect of this ravaged world. Uh, there will be a perfect, beautiful new creation wherein heaven and earth dwell perfectly together. Where God himself will dwell with man in the form of Jesus Christ. 
And there forever in eternity, we will dwell doing what God has created us to do with the vigor and energy that God has given us where we will never tire and we will actively be pursuing the gifts and talents God has given us to do. You will not be lazy in heaven. You will be actively working and doing what God has created you to do. You will be about doing uh, wonderful, miraculous, amazing things in eternity. Folks say, I, I think I'm going to get bored in heaven. No, you won't. No, you won't. You will be doing such amazing things. You will be so creative. You will be doing such things that you will never get tired or bored in heaven. Man, you will be amazed at what will be going on in heaven. So the choice this morning as we look through this wonderful book will be, where do I want to spend eternity? Do I want to go through this awful period that's coming where this world is going to be ravaged by disease and famine and war and torture? Or do I want to go spend my time being with the one who loved me and died for me and cared for me? Do, do I want to go to a judgment where I'll have to answer for everything I've ever done? Do I want to have to go and stand and admit to every sinful act I've ever committed? Or do I want to go and stand and have my Savior look his Father in the eye and say, Father, let them in my heaven. I paid the price for. Forgive them. Enter into my glory. Welcome home, child. Welcome home. You might ask me this morning if you're lost. If you're in this room today and say, I don't deserve to go to a place like that. But I sure don't want to go to that other place. Preacher, how in this world could a person like me go to heaven? Well, it's a pretty simple thing. All you have to do in just a minute, I'm going to just lead you in a short prayer. And in your heart, see, prayer, this prayer is not going to save you. What will save you is in your heart if you mean what we're going to talk about. And if in your heart, you'll just simply accept Jesus as your Savior. If you'll just admit to him that, yep, what we all know is that we're a sinner. And if you'll believe that Jesus paid the price for your sins. And ask him to come into your heart, into your life. The moment you sincerely do that, Jesus will forgive you of your sins. He'll make a new person out of you. And he'll write your name down in the Lamb's Book of Life. And you'll never have to worry about all these other things again. I want to tell you, eternity is too long to make the wrong choice. You say, well, preacher, that's too simple. You know why it's simple? Because it's not about you. It's not about you. See, the devil wants to throw up to you, but you, you know, it can't be that simple. You've done all these bad things. It doesn't matter because it's not about you. It's about him. He's the one that says, I'll do it for you. You have to be humble enough to say, yes, Lord. You did it, not me. Would you accept his provision today? Would you just bow your head, everyone, right now? And if you've never accepted Jesus, you say, or if you don't know that heaven will be your home, if today would be your last day here on planet Earth, would you just pray after me and would you say, Father, I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But I don't want to leave this world a sinner. Would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me of my sins? I accept freely your gift. Thank you for paying for my sins on Calvary. Please write my name down. I'm looking forward to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Amen. When nobody looking around, none of your business, this morning, if you one of those folks said, Preacher, I need to pray, I need to pray that prayer. Because I want to go to heaven. I don't want to miss heaven. 
Would you, just here in the quietness of this moment, with nobody looking around, and you prayed that prayer, and you're serious about it, and you want to do something about it, would you just lift your hand up where you are and say, Preach, I prayed. Preach, I prayed. I'm, I'm serious about this thing. Heaven's real. Hell's real. And I want to make sure heaven's real. I, I see the hands that's raised. I see the hand that's raised. I see the hand that's raised. You can put them down. I've seen them. You can put them down. And listen, we're serious. I'm not trying to jerk some emotional something out of you. I'm trying to make sure heaven's real to you. I don't want anybody to leave this world not ready for heaven. Anybody else said, preacher, I really need to pray that prayer. I, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. And I, I believe that there's been a price paid, and I believe Jesus loves it. Anybody else? Well, Father, I, I pray for those that raise their hands that you give peace to their lives, and they need to do business with you. I pray this morning and be the day. Speak to our hearts and our lives now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we stand and sing. You need to come to this front. You raise your hand. You need to come to the front. You need to talk to me about it. You need to make a profession of faith. What do you need to do in your life? Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but you said, uh, Preacher, I still need to come. Maybe there's some folks here that are believers, and you need to come pray about somebody that needs to be saved. Or maybe there's some things in your life you need to get straight today. I mean, it's time to do business. I, I just talked to you about some serious things that are happening in our world that says, we're coming to the end of this thing. It's time the church got serious. Now's the time. There's ever been a time. We got right. Run Charlie's. Story.